Before I introduce today's speaker, I asked Corey Stewart, who's running for Senate in the state of Virginia, and I invited Tim Kaine both to come and give you guys just a few minutes of why they think, that, why they think that you should support them. Corey Stewart is the only one who agreed to come, but he's the uh, Republican. Well, we actually had Tim Kaine once before. We invited Obama in 2012, and he sent Tim Kaine as his surrogate. So, so it won't be, uh, it's, it, it's not that he's never spoken here before. But Corey's the Republican Senate candidate in Virginia. He's currently the at-large chairman for the Board of Su County Board of Supervisors in Fairfax County. That's one of the most successful counties in the nation as far as financial, uh, fiscal operation. It's, it's one of only 36 jurisdictions that are rated AAA by, with their bond rating. It's rated ranked number one, the number one locality in job growth in Virginia, number three in the nation. He earned his law degree from William Mitchell's College of Law, where he graduated magna cum laude. He's kept taxes and spending low. He saved residents $205 million. We ask you to welcome to Liberty University for just a few minutes, Corey Stewart. Good morning. They're trying to tear down a good man. They're smearing him. They're smearing him, they're smearing his family, and in the process, they're smearing all of America. And why? They know that Judge Kavanaugh will protect our Second Amendment rights. They know that Judge Kavanaugh will protect the unborn. They know that Judge Kavanaugh will stay true to the Constitution of the United States. And so that is why the far left is trying to take down a good man. And in case there's anyone who believes that this is truly an attempt to protect women, consider this. Congress has paid $17 million in settlements for sexual harassment and sexual predator claims against members of Congress. The very men and women who are accusing Judge Kavanaugh of sexual harassment are sexual harassers themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, you are seeing America at trial. You are seeing the far left trying to destroy you, trying to destroy our country, trying to destroy our Constitution, trying to destroy our values. And the question is whether you are going to tolerate it. And it is going to be up to you and this generation from this great university. You can take this country back. You can stand up for your Constitution. You can stand up for your country. And all together, we can take back America. Thank you all very much. Appreciate you coming. My pleasure. Judge Jeanine Pera was invited here first by Young American Foundation, um, the Liberty Chapter. We attended, Becky and I attended, got to know her. Asked her to stay over for convo. She didn't have another set of clothes, so she wore the same clothes the next day. But she, uh, that was last year. But this year she came, she had advance notice, so she's got on fresh clothing this morning, so she's, she, <laughs> it's, it's good. But her new book is just incredible. Liars, Leakers, and Liberals, The Case Against the Anti-Trump Conspiracy. It's a number one New York Times bestseller. She's become a great friend of ours, a great friend of Becky's, and um, she hosts the show Justice with Judge Jeanine on Fox News Network and serves as a legal analyst at Fox News, on the Fox News Channel. She became an assistant district attorney for Westchester County, New York, and was the first female to prosecute murder cases there. She's tough. She's tough. You want to stay on her good side. In 1990, she was elected as the first woman to serve as a Westchester County judge. That's part of New York City. And in 1997, she was appointed to chair the New York State Commission on Domestic, Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board. She's really an accomplished attorney, judge, and uh, TV, TV personality, and we're very fortunate to have her here at Liberty. We, um, 
want you to now welcome to Liberty University Justice Judge Perro. Per per One of the revelations in the FBI report about Hillary Clinton that got me thinking was that her loyal aides destroyed multiple blackberries presumably at her order. That's a lot of work to cover something up. Don't believe me? Take a look. It's tonight, Street Justice. I'm here at Brothers Hardware, and I'm looking for a hammer. Let's go in. Jimmy? Yes, it's me. How are you? Not bad, not bad. Thanks for inviting us into Brothers Hardware. Pleasure. I'm looking for a hammer that is strong enough to get rid of a blackberry. You have any of that stuff? American made or import? Uh, I like American, although I don't know what she likes, but let's take a look. So tell me, what are my choices here? Well, you see, seeing you're a woman, there's a little light hammer. Well, hold on, hold on. Seeing I'm a woman? It's a woman's, you know, it's an like, announced you know, ladies' hammer, they call it. Dad! You really want to do the damage? Yeah, I'm interested in damage. You got this bad boy. That's four pounds. That's four Whoa! Pounds. That's this is heavy. Now I'm gonna make believe I'm one of Hillary's aides destroying the evidence. I will start with the ladies' hammer, and although they want me to wear goggles, I prefer my own sunglasses. You know what? Jimmy's right, it takes more than the ladies' hammer. All right, now I'm taking the He-Man hammer. to destroy a blackberry. I gotta tell you, look at my arms. I have strong arms, okay? What did it take for them to destroy the evidence in the Hillary's case? A lot. I'm gonna use both hands. Ah, I'm getting better at this, Jimmy. I just beat the crap out of this blackberry. Now, why would someone do that to a blackberry? It's not as good as an iPhone. Not as good as an iPhone. If I had gotten a subpoena and they said, save your Blackberry, but instead I took a hammer to it, what does it tell you about me? I don't know. I don't that know. you hate Blackberries? Yeah, you don't like the Blackberries? <laughs> or that maybe I didn't want to hand it over because they subpoenaed it? Right, right. You didn't want to share any information there? You gonna vote for her? Don't think so. You see this Blackberry? I just beat it up with a hammer. How tall are you? Maybe I didn't want the people who subpoenaed it to get it. Well, that's a possibility, sure. Know where I'm going? I don't, really. Tampering, destruction, contempt? Right? I think so. You still gonna vote for her? For whom? Hillary! Oh, 100%. Does it mean that I really didn't want them to get the information or I just wanted to destroy it? What does it tell you? That you're trying to hide something. She's quick. Yeah, but may good, good. No, wait, maybe they were hiding. Okay, can I buy a dress? It's gorgeous. I'm gonna come back. I have no money. Okay. You still gonna vote for Hillary? Oh, forget ah! about Hillary. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget about Benghazi. So for them to destroy the blackberries with a hammer took a lot of work, a lot of intent, Jim Comey, if this ain't intent, then there's no such thing. <laughs> and here's the evidence. And next, I'll take you along with me on, on a trip through my vacation photo album. We'll be right back. Here's the evidence. Joining us tonight, Judge Jeanine Pirro. Former prosecutor and judge. Host of Justice with Judge Jeanine. Well, President Trump loves to watch her show. The author of the number one New York Times bestseller. It's called Liars, Leakers, and Liberals. Detailing the power structure, trying to bring the president down. Think about how the FBI and the DOJ has been hiding everything they can. I mean, this is a made-up Russia collusion delusion. We are back with Judge Jeanine Pirro. I want to answer your question because you gave you had to ask you a question. You I, your I, opening statement, which was how horrible it is, that Donald Trump no, is talking no, no, about that's all you, of these no, I'm people. Sorry, you know that's what you horrible? said. You said, well, but you know you what's said horrible? that it, when it was who it's shouldn't okay. be here end it's, up murdering the children of Americans. After that, I was cursed at, and I and my team were thrown out of the building. The view was just a microcosm of what's going on in this country. We can disagree, but we need to be able to talk about it.
Good morning, Liberty! It is a pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure to come back. I look forward to coming back. So when President Falwell and Mrs. Falwell invited me back, and Pastor Nasser said, yeah, Janine, we'd love to have you come back. I couldn't wait to get here. Because you are the future, and you are the people who will decide the direction that this nation takes. So my question to you, and my question when I end this, will be, who are you? Who are you? Are you a reflection of your parents' thinking? Are you the embodiment of their genes? Are you an independent thinking individual? Are your thoughts shaped by the environment and what your peers think? Or are you you? the special person that God made with an independent mind and now with an education at liberty that supports the very foundation of your essence as the image and likeness of God. I'm a Catholic, I'm a Christian, I believe in God, and my whole life is a reflection of my faith and my belief in God. And that's what I want you to remember. No matter who you are and what you do, it is God who is the wind beneath your sails. It is God who takes you to the heights and lifts you up when you are down. I know. I know because I've been up and I've been down. So who am I? I grew up in Elmira, New York. I'm sure you never heard of it. You did? Oh, I'm so happy. All right, Elmira, New York. It's a small town in upstate New York that's more like the heartland of America, and I worked in a dairy. And they milk cows by hand and not with computers. I'm no spring chicken. I wanted to become a lawyer, and everyone said to me, well, you're a woman, I mean, you're just going to have kids and you'll never go to work. Sounds foreign, I'm sure, to the women in this audience, but it's what I grew up with. It was the pushback that I always had. And so I went to law school, and I applied for a job. I graduated, I mean, I did very well, and I applied for a job as an assistant district attorney. They didn't know what to do with me, so they put me in the Appeals Bureau. But I wanted to try cases, and I wanted to fight. I believe in right and wrong and truth and justice. It's what I learned in Elmira, New York. It's what my parents taught me. My background was about church on Sunday, education, and family. That's what it was about. Nothing more and nothing less. And so I went to the then district attorney and I said, Mr. Vigari, I'd like to try a case. Women can't go for the jugular. And that was the thinking at the time. You can't let a woman in a courtroom, let alone have her try a homicide case. So because I was law review, they put me in appeals and I review all of the convictions to argue in a higher court for the affirmance of the conviction. So one day I'm sitting at lunch in the library with all the guys, there are no women there, and um, they're complaining. They're complaining that they have to go up county somewhere in Westchester, which is where I'm from, and try a case, good old Westchester, uh, still live there, and they said, we have to try a case, I wanna go on a date, I wanna go here, I wanna go there. So I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, they keep telling me, no, I can't, I can't. Even though those were the rules then, I said, I have an idea. How about I take the file 
and I take your calendar for Thursday. Oh, you can't, Janine. You don't know how to try a case. I said, but I'll put your name on the file. And there weren't computers then. So everything was handwritten in the file room. So then I started trying cases. They would come back and say, this is great. She's doing this court. She's doing that court. She's... After about a year of trying cases, and I won every one, I get a call to the district attorney's office. He says, who do you think you are trying cases? You're never going to get out of appeals. Women can't do this. I said, but Mr. Vigari, I won every case. He said, you're lucky. And I said, I wasn't lucky. Mr. Vigari, I read all your transcripts when you were a trial attorney, and that's how I learned to try a case. And flattery got me everywhere. <laughs> so, as a woman, I walked into the courtroom for my first homicide, and there was a hush. When the judge says that people are being represented by Janine Pirro, the whole place, all the jurors, it's like 150 jurors in the room. There was a hush. I won that case in every case after. It wasn't about me. It was about the position I was in and all the women who were behind me. All the women who would be confronted with the same reality that I was, and that is, you can't do this because you're this or you're that. It doesn't matter. For me, it was about trying cases. It's what I loved and it's what I did for 30 years. But the good part is, for all those men, and it's not about men and women, it's not. But for all those men who said, she can't try a case, she doesn't know what she's doing, I got elected district attorney and I was their boss. And when I ran for judge, they said, she can't be a judge. You've got to be tough to sentence someone to life. Are you kidding? I sought the death penalty. I'm not proud of it. But when you take a woman and you kill her four kids in front of her by eviscerating them and then kill her last, that deserves the death penalty. That's personal. That's what the problem is in this country. We don't take crime personally enough. I've spent my life in the trenches where the fight between good and evil unfolds every day. And it matters not what the context is. You will be confronted with good and evil for the rest of your life. So what are you going to do? This is what you're going to do. You're going to put a stake in the ground and you're going to say, I can do this. And you're going to stand witness to that belief. And you're not going to let anyone push you off that belief. Because you are the one who determines your destiny, no one else. You know, I started the first domestic violence unit in the nation in 1978 when everyone thought that battered women, you know, they just, you know, they were babies, they were hysterical all of this other nonsense. For me, it was always about protecting and defending the underdog. The child victim who goes to sleep in her own bed to become victims of unspeakable torture and abuse in her own home. I know pain and I know injustice. And I want to talk to you about how that translates to the news today. I have been a student of the Constitution my whole adult life. I believe in truth and I believe in justice. And with God at my side, I will always fight for what I believe in. You can't win those cases. Those battered women, they're just looking for money. The sex is better after they get together. You can't win them. Well, I started a program that was a pilot program for the Department of Justice across the nation. 
And we crusaded for women. And we crusaded for men, too, who were victims of domestic violence, who didn't want to admit it because our culture says, if a woman stabbed you, then you're a wuss. I fought for everyone who was treated unfairly by a, by a, by a criminal who makes a decision to involve a victim in the criminal justice system. It shouldn't even be called the criminal justice system. It should be called the victim's justice system. The person who never chose to be a part of it in the first place. So fast forward to Brett Kavanaugh. You know, the Constitution requires due process, the right of confrontation, the right of cross-examination, uh, and in criminal courts, and I've said this as a judge and as a trial lawyer and as the DA, my office prosecuted 40,000 cases a year. This, is, this, isn't, uh, this just isn't something that we came up with. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out it's got to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt. You've got to have probable cause before you even make a decision to charge someone with a crime. And I'm telling you this, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford wouldn't have made it past the entrance in my office. Now that doesn't mean that I'm not sensitive to victims, and there are victims who suffer from repressed memory. But sometimes through hypnosis and therapy, there's something called confabulation. And they know something happened, and I believe something happened to her. But you gotta use your God-given common sense. Are you gonna tell me that 17-year-old Brett Kavanaugh was so brilliant that he could select three women. We've got, uh, we've got Christine Ford, we've got Swetnick, we've got Deborah Ramirez, whoever they are. How is this guy so brilliant that he could pick the three women in the same year who would all have repressed memories and never say a word about it for 35 years? All of a sudden they decide after 35 years, yeah, I'm a victim. So how do you decide truth? How do you decide if someone's telling the truth? It's just as Kavanaugh said at that hearing yesterday, does it ring true to you? Does it make sense? It doesn't. Every witness she said corroborated her and the party said there was no party. I don't know what she's talking about. These are her friends. I don't want to get into politics today. I didn't want to. I want to give you hope, and I want to give you faith to believe in yourself, and with God's help, you'll do, I don't care if you want to be an astronaut, a rocket scientist, an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer, and I think you could do it all here at Liberty University. <laughs> I love this place. I really do. I love Liberty University. I love this place. So the God-given common sense, wait a minute. 35 years later, you want to talk about it. This kid's got a calendar. He learned it from his own father. He has a calendar of everything he did in 1982. But they want to prosecute him on a yearbook. I don't even want to look my yearbook up for fear of what I've said as a wise guy. I just don't want to, I'm afraid of it. What is happening? There is no proof. There is no evidence. There is no confrontation, cross-examination. What we saw yesterday was a circus and a strip down of a man who has spent his life in the pursuit of justice at the highest echelons of our government. But they don't care. They want to take him down. They don't care that there's no corroboration. And let me tell you, I've tried rape cases. I've decided whether cases should go to trial. I've been in charge and in panel grand juries. I've sentenced rapists. I know this business. You can convict someone on a he said, she said. 
as long as you can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. How do you know who to believe? Recent outcry is important. Sure, a lot of women don't come forward. I know that. But at some point, you come forward. What else is important? The who, how, when, and where. She doesn't know when. She doesn't know where. But she knows it's him. What I want to know is, when is the first time you mentioned the name Kavanaugh? And she can't fly to meet the committee? The committee was going to fly to California? I remember reading that and thinking to myself, they're going to accommodate her. She has, she's afraid to fly. But then my own investigation, she did some kind of program when she lived in California and Hawaii. How the heck did she get to Hawaii if she's afraid to fly? Did she surf her way? And then she says, well, I didn't know you wanted to come out there, and I don't know who paid for the lie detector. First of all, why do you take a lie detector before it's even out there? So she goes to the Democrats, and that's fine. But use your common sense. Did you pay for the lie detector? Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, we paid for the lie detector, her attorneys say. Why do you need a lie detector? You're trying to prove that she's credible. And that's their biggest argument. Well, I stand in front of you right now to tell you there's a reason lie detectors are not admitted in courtrooms across this country, because there's, they're unreliable and because you can trick a lie detector. I know how to do it. I have a lot of friends in law enforcement after 35 years, three decades I spent as a prosecutor, a judge, and a DA. Every and buddy I know in law enforcement thinks this is a joke, but it doesn't matter. And this is where politics comes into play. When they can strip you down, when they can destroy you because of your beliefs, this is more than just a Supreme Court justice. This is someone who will determine the next generations the ethics and moral core and law and our societal rules. They think that they're heroes. It's about Roe versus Wade, and he's going to do this, and he's going to do that. There is nothing that even indicates any of that. And honestly, I don't care. He's a judge. He's going to decide based on precedent, based on the facts before him, not on a political ideology. I was a judge. Judges determine the law and the facts and come to a conclusion. Five minutes? Okay. I got a lot I could talk to you about. There are dark forces in this country right now that seek to sabotage everything that is good and just. When the words law and order and truth and justice are objectionable, when young people need a safe space because you're going to trigger them if you talk about God. When a president gets up at a national prayer breakfast two days after or a week after an American is beheaded by ISIS and says, Christians, get off your high horse, we got trouble, guys. I don't ever want to see a Christian shamed for what they believe in. I don't want Christianity to be taboo. This is a nation that was founded on Judeo-Christian ethics. Above my courtroom it read, in God we trust. You go to the Museum of the Bible, and I'm going to give them a plug right now. It's in Washington, D.C., and they have a ride, and it's kind of like a Disneyland ride. And you just go, you fly through Washington, through the halls of, con uh, of Congress, through the uh, um, Jefferson Memorial, and on all of these stations in Washington are the words of the Bible, are the Psalms. We are a Christian nation. They are trying to destroy truth 
and God and everything like that. I'm going to say Merry Christmas, and I'm darn happy Donald Trump made that a fundamental rule of his campaign. So, we've lost decency. <laughs> you know, I used to have a gavel. I don't know how long it took, but I broke it. It wasn't a good idea. There's a lot of ugliness in the world, a lot of pain that people go through for no reason. But I put my stake in the ground, and for all the criticism, and I've run for office five times, and politics, I must tell you, especially in New York, is a blood sport. I've paid my dues. They have stripped me down, too. They've accused me of all kinds of things. But it was my belief in myself and my belief in God it was my putting the stake in the ground and standing witness to the fact that I believed in my truths. And what I want you to do, whatever field you choose, just like the song said, and I was so impressed with the song, Victory, who could change the words you've spoken? Who could ever stand against your name? There is none beside you. You are holy, holy. So you put that stake in the ground, each and every one of you. You trust in God, you trust in yourself, and you trust in the United States of America. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you're all inspired at what you can accomplish just from her story, because she's incredible. I told the president recently he needs to fire Jeff Sessions. And w wouldn't it be wonderful if she got his job? Now, today she's going to be walking around campus interviewing students for street justice, right? Yep. Okay. All right, so here's the deal. You saw street justice up there, right? Okay. I'm going to do street justice on the campus here on the green. I think I call it the green. And you know how you'll know me? Not from my hammer. I promise I'm not bringing the hammer. We'll be there with cameras. I want to hear what you have to think. I want to hear what you have to say. I want America to see what proud students you are. So be there. Okay. Yeah, we want, we want you guys to become famous, but, but please, uh, we were going to sell her book for $15.99, but David and I just talked, and we've decided to discount it to 10 bucks. I think you'll love it. I think you'll, it'll open your eyes to what's going on in this country in ways that you won't believe. So please, books are available right here, and go make yourselves famous on the lawn this afternoon. And have a great fall break. Thank you.